I'm going to call up our panelists here for our final panel conversation of the day. We're going to have a terrific uh, discussion about infrastructure, which we've talked about here for the last two days, but about the infrastructure of opportunity. Today we talk really about the physical infrastructure that undergirds South Carolina. We're talking about roads and bridges and ports, and in some places sewers. I mean, the things, the physical activities that we talk about that mean infrastructure. How do we pay for it? How do we improve them? How, how does that tie into economic development in South Carolina? So as I move here to the stage, let me introduce our guest this morning. We have South Carolina Senator Sean Bennett, of course, from Somerville. We have uh, Pete Selleck, who is the chairman and president of Michelin North America. And of course, we have Jack Ellenberg, who is from South Carolina Ports Authority. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Let me start uh, with you, Senator, because this is a very tough issue, a tough time to be in the Senate, receiving pressure from constituents who say, don't raise my taxes under any circumstances, receiving pressure from business groups who say, if you don't make improvements, we can't really perform at the level we expect to, receiving pressure from just common citizens who say, how are we going to fix our roads? There is... For you, this is kind of a no-win situation in many ways, but a situation that has to be tackled. Um, how do you approach these conversations with your constituents, with business leaders, with gentlemen like this? Hmm. Big, big question, I know. It's a big, big topic. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I, I see my role uh, in the Senate as getting as much information as possible from all parties, uh, from from whether constituents, business groups, whoever, the, the, the folks that have a vested interest in the decision being made. Um, unfortunately, I will say that some of my colleagues don't necessarily share that, that idea, um, try to get some information from very narrow focus groups. Um, it, but it's important to have the conversation with, with everybody involved. Um, th this, in my opinion, the transportation infrastructure, particularly, as well as workforce development, um, are the two most critical issues facing the state of South Carolina for the next hundred years. And um, when something's that important, you just have to do it. I mean, you can't, you can't let the politics of the, of the process uh, get away from you. But as we've seen over and over and over and over, the politics does get in the way of it. And let's make no mistake, the bill is due. It's been, it's really overdue, quite honestly. But yet, how do you break through that politics? Yep. Who can be that person to do that? Well, I think it takes leadership from all, from all branches of government as well as the private sector. And uh, the private sector has clearly done their job. Um, they have let us know for years now that uh, the transportation infrastructure problem that we face is beginning to cripple their, their business. Uh, and what people need to understand is once those businesses are crippled, we as a society are crippled. Um, so that message is done. It's time now for, for government to do that. Uh, to be perfectly honest, we've had some, some fairly poor leadership on this uh, in government, uh, over, particularly over the last two years. I think we've got caught, caught up in a, in, in a lot of gamesmanship that just does not advance the ball. Um, I'm happy to say this week, I think we did advance the ball. Uh, we'll know, uh, we'll probably know by Wednesday of next week uh, in the Senate whether or not we've broken through. Um, the, the bill that we have tentatively come to coalesce around is not a perfect bill, uh, but it does get dedicated funding to our road system. Uh, so I'm just hopeful that we can, we can pull it off. Mr. Selleck, uh, this conversation in business circles has been going on for a long time. That's one thing. But it has really only recently percolated up to be a public issue to where the public generally at, at large has been aware and very concerned. Uh, what is your message uh, when you talk to elected officials from your point of view about you know, your business and the needs for South Carolina? What, what do you talk about with, with your elected officials when you, when you go to Columbia? I was speaking at, a, at the University of South Carolina about 18 months ago to a group of business students, and they asked me what keeps me up at night. And I proceeded to explain them how we do risk management at Michelin, how we try to identify everything that can go wrong, how we obviously try to eliminate as many of those risks, or at least reduce the probability they're going to happen, and then for the ones that we can't eliminate, develop plans on how we're going to deal with it. So I, I said, look, I sleep really well at night. 
you know, we seem to be on top of most things. I said, but let me, you know, you're, you're 20 years old, most of you college students. Let me tell you what should be keeping you awake at night. Okay, because, you know, they're... <laughs> Turn, turning the tables. They're the bit. ones, that, they're the future. They're, they're the people that we're working for today. These are our children and our grandchildren. And I told them there's two issues that, you know, from my perspective, should really bother them. One is at the federal level, and that's the complete imbalance between revenue and spending. Uh, on an annual basis, that's called the deficit. On the long-term basis, that's called the national debt. Um, we've got a lot of problems in our country right now because we, our spending is, is just going the wrong way. And if you even hear the political discussion at the national level, you're, the question gets, gets asked, what are you going to do about the, the debt? What are you going to do about the, the fiscal situation? And the standard answer on the campaign trail is, well, go to my website. Go to my website. Where you can donate. Yeah. <laughs> By the way. And that starts the conversation. <laughs> but because the discussion is difficult, the solutions to the, to the federal fiscal issue are, are difficult. And it's not going to involve spending more. It's not going to involve free college for everybody. I, you know, I wish we could do that, but today we, we're not in a position to do that financially as a, as a nation. And at the same time, it's not going to involve reducing taxes. Every responsible organization, every bipartisan group that's looked at this has said the only way you solve the problem is you, you take a good hard look at entitlements, you take, and, and basically you reduce them, you extend retirement ages, you reduce the COLA factors, you do, I'm a military retiree. I shouldn't be a military retiree, I'm 60 years old. Okay, that needs to be reformed. That's the same, when my grandfather went in the Army, that was a great, that, that was what you needed, but today our life expectancy is longer. Maybe when I'm 65 or 70, I should be a military retiree, but I shouldn't be. And that needs, those are type, the types of things that need to be changed, but we, you can imagine how difficult it is when you start to get into all of these issues related to, gosh, touching benefits for veterans. But, you know, there cannot be any sacred cows. We have to, we have to reform the entire process of entitlements, of the, the, the tax code, which involves obviously many, many different elements. The corporate tax rate in the United States is very high, and we know we have to address that long term, but an infrastructure spending at the, at the national level is too low. But and it's been too low for generations and generations. Yeah, so, so that's the national issue. But then on the, on the state issue, I said the one issue, if I were 20 years old, that I would be really hacked off about are the roads. Now, I, and I want to tell everyone that, I, that before I said this word, and there are several in this room that, that admonished me afterwards for having said it, but you know, I, I did check to make sure there wasn't any press in the room. But I, you know, I, said, I said the roads in South Carolina are a disgrace. They're a disgrace. And the next morning on a lot of state newspapers, that became the headline, the largest employer in the state says that the roads are a disgrace. And, you know, and, and, but most of the social media chatter after that was, duh. Right. You know, you're, just, you're telling us something stating, we don't know? That's stating the obvious. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's very clear, and Michelin has put down a huge investment in this state. We're going to be here for the next 50, 100 years. I don't know how long it's going to be. And we came here, we came to South Carolina in the 70s because the state had worked on its infrastructure, particularly, you know, the, the technical college system that Governor Holling started back in the early 60s, the GSP airport which was a huge attractive factor, brought Michelin in. So infrastructure attracted business. And, but at the same time, once you have it, you do have to maintain it. And the problem, you know, infrastructure is a, it's a lot easier to put it in than it is to develop a plan to maintain it long term. We have the same problem in our plants at Michelin. We have to look at infrastructure. It's a challenge for us, but you have to do it. And right now, it's not getting done. And I don't know how to solve the problem. That's the responsibility of our elected officials. But, you know, it, it has to get solved. The current trajectory is just simply not acceptable. Jack, when we talk about the ports, it is a huge economic driver uh, for the state of South Carolina, but it can only be as effective as some of the ancillary services that work with the port. You have to have effective rail lines that leave the port. You have to have effective roads to take that cargo wherever it is going to go. Um, what problems are you facing uh, that doesn't allow the port to be all that it can be? Well, that's a great question, Mark. It, when you look at the Port of Charleston, when you look at the assets of the port, that includes Georgetown, that includes our inland port in Greer, we are the state's most strategic asset. We firmly believe that we are driving the economy of this state. You look at South Carolina as a whole, we're blessed with some of the companies that call South Carolina home, Michelin, BMW, other companies like that, that chose to locate here not just because we have a great workforce, which we do, 
not just because we have uh, forward-thinking uh, officials leading our state, which we do, but because we can move product in and out very easily. And most of that comes across our terminals in Charleston, Georgetown, and up in Greer. As we grow and as our industry evolves, more pressure is going to be placed on the Port of Charleston, the Port Network in the United States. We need to take advantage of that. So if you look at Charleston, for example, what's driving change in our industry is the ships are getting bigger. And not uh, bigger, much bigger. If you look at the massive ship that- Massive is a fair description. Massive, I mean, almost twice as big as what you're used to seeing when you look out, you know, if you're at Sullivan's Island, those ships look big. You know, this new wave of ships that are coming online uh, are incredibly large. That's an understatement, Mark. Right. Absolutely. Just to kind of put it in context, we have 30 ship calls a week on average in Charleston. 11 of those ships are too big to get through the Panama Canal today. Those 11 ships carry more cargo than the other 19 across our terminals. 52% of the cargo coming in and out of Charleston every month, or every week, I should say, comes on one of those 11 vessels. Those vessels aren't the biggest that's, that are coming. Those are about 9,000 TEUs. TEU is a 20-foot equivalent unit. What you're used to seeing, uh, perhaps in your manufacturing environment, or up and down the interstate, are 40-foot boxes. Um, we expect by the end of this year to have a 14,000 TEU vessel coming into Charleston. That's 7,000 40-foot containers on that vessel when fully loaded. That's a 1,200-foot long ship, 167 feet wide, and drafts just over 48 feet of water when fully loaded. Now that type of vessel uh, can only call on five ports on the East Coast. There's only one port in the Southeast it can call on, and that's Charleston. We expect to see that vessel here uh, again in the fall of this year. That's going to put an enormous amount of pressure on our infrastructure. That is why we're making the investments that we're making uh, as a ports authority in our infrastructure on terminal, including uh, deepening the harbor to 52 feet mean low water, including the, the construction of the new uh, Hugh Leatherman terminal at the Navy base, including the raising of the cranes that we're doing, all to accommodate these big vessels. Uh, but that cargo's got to get in and out. If it doesn't get in and out of our terminal, it doesn't matter. Uh, many of our customers, like Michelin, like BMW, are relying upon the supply chain that we created. They're relying on an efficient supply chain to be able to keep their operations going. When we opened Greer, the inland port in Greer, we opened it uh, with our launch customer being BMW, just in sequence supplying of containers from the port of Charleston into the production process. When we get a call from BMW to deliver a container, we have 45 minutes to take it from our inland port in Greer and put it into production, not take it to the plant, get it into production to keep that plant from shutting down. So the margins for error are very, very slim. And so we need a robust infrastructure to be able to deliver those containers. So what are we doing? We are looking at alternate ways to move those containers in and out of our operations. Greer is a great example. So if you look at the intermodal move of a container, we opened Greer back in 2013. Uh, in two years of operation, we've moved over 120,000 containers through Greer via rail. That's 120,000 containers that moved from Charleston into the Greer market or from Greer to Charleston on rail. That's 120,000 fewer trucks on Interstate 26 as a result of Greer. Uh, and it continues to grow. It continues to grow. We view that as a wise investment. It will not be the last inland port we make. If you look at intermodal, uh, intermodal in the last five years is up probably about 166% in Charleston. Makes up about 22% of our volume, which means 78% of our volume moves in and out of Charleston via truck. We do think intermodal will continue to grow, but it will never take over the lion's share of the movement of cargo. It simply can't. And so that's going to put a lot of pressure on the road network to make sure that it is viable moving forward. The other thing that I think is important to point out is within the port world, you have what's called local ports and regional ports. A local port would be a New York or a Los Angeles, Long Beach, mm -hmm. where most of the product coming in stays in the market. You got 40 million people in the, ups, in the New York area, you got 40 million people in the Los Angeles area. Anything that comes in and out of the southeast has to go inland somewhere. So you look at the southeastern United States, we're the fastest growing population in the country. More people want to live in the southeast than live in any other part of the world, or any other part of the U.S., excuse me. 
uh, maybe the world as well. Um, we also make more goods for, man for global consumption in the southeast. So we've got to be able to move that product in and out. We don't stop at the borders of the state. You know, we serve 26 states, 120 countries. So the ability to move that cargo in and out is not limited to the infrastructure of South Carolina. It's a nationwide issue uh, and one that perhaps comforting uh, to some but, but not really to us. Uh, we're not alone, South Carolina. Every state has an infrastructure challenge, which going back to, to Pete's comments, this is a national issue. But there's no reason that South Carolina can't be a leader and a model for the rest of the country to follow. Yeah, a national issue. Governor Rendell will address that here momentarily. But Senator Bennett, let's face it, when you talk about infrastructure in the world of politics, it is not a sexy issue. You know, it's not one that you go out there to your civic group or your local club and talk about and give people, yeah, infrastructure, that's awesome. Let's, what are we going to do? Right. Because a lot of these tangible, they're, they're not tangible benefits in many ways. You know, water lines are hidden, sewer lines are hidden. You know, the roads you do realize. Uh, but it is hard to get people motivated and excited about this topic. Um, how do you bring this to them to understand, to know that hey, if you have bad roads, that means lost productivity because you're sitting in traffic. Uh, if you don't have access to good high-speed internet, you're not part of the globalized economy. These are things that many other countries are far outpacing the U.S. on. Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, I think I would have agreed with you a couple years ago, uh, but now it has become the sexy topic. Uh, only because people do realize it. The reality is, unfortunately, though, they realize it because um, of the pain that they're starting to feel. And I'm sure you feel because you have to travel back and forth down I-26. And let's face it, that, that could be a tough commute. It's a gamble whether you're going to get down there on time or not. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. And, you know, probably five times out of ten. You're not. You're not. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the point that I think is important to make is, is that Pete uh, spoke to is, you know, the Michelins of the world, the Boeings of the world, the BMWs of the world, um, if we don't solve this problem, they'll solve their own problem. I mean, they'll just move to, to other areas or they'll, they'll shift manufacturing to, to other locations that they have across the country and across the globe. Uh, the, the problem is, uh, in my area, it's the scout boats and the Haas saws, uh, you know, those folks, the small businesses that make up the vat, collectively make up the vast majority uh, of the employers in, in our state, they can't do that. So they're either going to uh, die a very painful death, and with that, uh, so will, the, will, the, will their employees. Uh, we, we have got to solve this problem, uh, and people understand that. People are starting to understand that clearly. Um, people in Columbia understand it. It's just the, the pain of getting to the point where we put forward a solution that, that everybody can agree upon. Uh, and as I've said, I, I think we have one now, at least to start the ball rolling, um, but it's one of those where there's going to be a lot of people, myself included, they are going to have to hold our nose. And, and vote for that because it's probably not the ultimate solution. It's better than we have now, but it's not going to be the ultimate solution. What do you think is keeping us from having that ultimate solution? In, in my opinion, I believe, you know, it's, it's the catchword that we hear uh, across the nation these days is special interests, right? Uh, the special interest groups are the ones that I believe are keeping us from having uh, that real conversation. And I'm talking about the special interest groups on, on the opposite sides of the political spectrum. Um, those are the challenges. Uh, those are the folks that unfortunately, uh, wh whether they just uh, aren't willing to engage in the discussion or know the results of the discussion but t that want to ignore it, they're the ones that are trying to, to, um, to set the narrative as being a very narrow scope. Uh, it's, it's all about tax increases. It's all about this. It's all about that. When in reality, it's about all these things. It's about moving uh, goods out of the ports. It's about moving people from, from point A to point B. It's about safety. It's, it's about emergency response times. It's all these things. You know, I, I live in Somerville, uh, and right before Christmas, my wife and I met some friends downtown Charleston for dinner. Um, it took me as long to go three and a half miles from my home to the interchange at Interstate 26 
as it then did to go from Interstate 26 to downtown Charleston. The wow. exact same amount of time. Um, those types of things, people, we, ca we can't have. It cripples our business community, but it cripples us as well. Keeps us from spending time with our families, keeps us from getting to jobs, keeps us from getting to schools. Um, you know, we have, we have children in the state on the bus for two and three hours uh, because of traffic and road conditions. That's not conducive to any type of learning. Um, it, it's, a hard, it's a hard question, but we've, we have to have people willing to have the conversation in its totality and not just small segments of the, of the argument. Mr. Selleck, Michelin is an international company. I am sure that you travel the globe in the work that you do. And I'm sure that you see in, in other industrialized countries in Europe, not just China, uh, but in Europe, where they are far outpacing us in this area of infrastructure. Are there times when you go to airports in Europe and train stations and look around and drive on the roads and go, why can't we have this in what we consider to be the greatest country on earth? Well, my, my experience is when you visit a lot of places that have new things, it's always wonderful. You go to China, you go to Beijing, you see the new Terminal 5, and you say, wow. Uh, but believe me, infrastructure is a problem everywhere. And I think the, you know, the challenge for our country will be, as it has always been in the past, to figure out once we, once we, we kind of have hit, hit bottom on some of these issues, how do we come up with solutions that perhaps the rest of the world cannot come up with? And, and I think a lot of this is going to depend on um, increasing discussion on these issues. And, and, and I think we have responsibilities in our, in our organizations to communicate a lot better. There was an interesting article in the Wall Street Journal the week prior to the Republican uh, primary where there was, a, there was a picture of a woman working at BMW. And, you know, she was, talk, she was a supervisor at BMW. She's very appreciative of what BMW has done for her and her family basically talked about how BMW had turned her family's life around. And then she proceeded to talk about how she was favoring a certain political candidate because he was, he was going to, uh, he was basically going to put up barriers to trade. You know, and, and I, I don't want to pick on BMW because it made me think about Michelin. Do we talk to our people about how important free trade is to Michelin? The fact that we make earth mover tires here in South Carolina, 80% of them go to, most of them go to Charleston, some of them go to Savannah, a few. but most of them go, go to the port and they're going all over the world. And that's the beauty of BMW, that's the beauty of GE with their, with their gas turbines, that's, that's right. the beauty of Boeing. We're a center of manufacturing, not just for the United States, we're a, we're a global center of manufacturing. So free trade, of course, is in, is in the interest of all of our companies, and yet we have not talked to our employees about the things that are important to, their, to the success of the companies that have provided them so much. So it really, it, it's really made me much more aware of my responsibility to be a little, and, and, and it's, it's not having a political conversation, it's just explaining to people the reality of the world, what, what it takes for a BMW, or for a Boeing, or for a Michelin to be successful, and why some of this political rhetoric that may sound uh, very seductive is in fact, you know, absolutely against the, their own interest. So we, ha we have to really do a lot more communicating with our people. People have been voting against their own economic self-interest for many years. Uh, Jack, you, you, we all have to navigate to some extent the political world, you know, no matter you know, what you do for a living in public life, but do you think that there are ways to have productive conversations about these issues and somehow extract as much politics as possible out of it so we can have real conversations at a very high level so people like Senator Bennett can feel a little safer having those open dialogues? I think we can. If you look at economic development in South Carolina, and I've been fortunate to have been uh, the bulk of my career 21 years in economic development. The one thing that brings everyone together is economic development. Economic development, simply put, is creating opportunities for the citizens. Whether they're a new plant coming in, whether it's infrastructure improvements, it's all about making uh, the situation better for the citizens. And I've never been in an environment where people chose party lines on economic development discussions. They all coalesce and all say, what can we do to advance the ball? And so I do think it's easy to get the politics out of the discussion if it's couched in the right manner. 
And simply put, it's got to be, this is what's best for the citizens of the state and our future generations. The other thing that we have to keep in mind as we go through this discussion is there's no quick fix to this problem. Infrastructure will take a long time to build. and It'll take a long time to maintain. So as we're talking about the projects that are out there, we're talking about improving our infrastructure. This isn't a one and done discussion. This is a how do we fix what we have today and how do we continue to plan for changes tomorrow? You know, in my world, nothing happens inexpensively, nothing happens quickly. And I think we're facing the exact same challenge on the infrastructure. You know, we, we joke about uh, uh, the fact that uh, we started our post-45 deepening project, meaning go from 45 feet mean low water to 50, 52 feet mean low water. We started that in 2009. We will be finished in 2019. It's a 10-year project, over $500 million to deepen our harbor. That is considered a model at the U.S. level for speed to get an infrastructure project done. There's something wrong with the discussion when a 10-year project is held up as an example of how things are done right. Um, I look at my, my colleagues to the south, not too far from here in Savannah. They started their river dredge in 1996. They haven't started construction yet, 20 years later. We've got to figure out a way to move that, that forward uh, in a much quicker, uh, much uh, rapid fashion. Same with their road infrastructure. We can come up with a solution tomorrow. That's right. But we have to implement it. And how long will it take? And what barriers can we take down that will allow those projects to move forward in as quick a manner as possible? Because again, we're playing catch up. We've got a long way to go. I was just going to add, you know, to use that example of that deepening, you know, the General Assembly put $300 million into a fund for that deepening with relatively little discussion. Hardly quickly. any. Hardly right. any. Yeah. Hardly any. But yet, for the last year and a half on the roads, we've been fighting and kicking and screaming about roughly the same amount of money. Um, it, it is, it, it's mind-boggling at times that I think you're right. Um, if you can couch it around the economic development and everybody sees the need uh, for, the, for the deepening of the harbor, and we're able to very quickly act on that, um, but the struggle here is, uh, the roads is, is a little more difficult. Now, granted, that's one time versus recurring funds. Sure, sure. But, uh, but still. But on the 300 million, I think it's important to know, first of all, we greatly appreciate it. Um, because You're it welcome. put us in a position to succeed. We became the only state that had its entire share of the harbor deepening money sitting in the bank ready to go. No other port in the country could say that. So when we went to Washington in an effort to secure federal approval, they looked at us and said, South Carolina's got their act together. They already have their share sitting in the bank ready to go. No one else does. We're moving them to the top of the list. So it's, it's forward thinking like that, which has enabled Charleston to maintain its competitive advantage within the port industry. They had their so act together. They had their Little act did together. they know, right? <laughs> uh, that's your comment. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah, I'll say it. Little did they know. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Selly, you, know, you, you brought up an interesting point about that headline grabbing uh, attention that you had there about the roads. But I dare say that, you know, the general populace would look at that headline and internalize that more positively coming from someone like you, who's a business leader, a respected business leader of an international company, than they would from an elected official, from their local official, from a county official. Uh, just because of the world we live in today, that it's even more effective. Is there a way for much of the business community to come together and speak with one voice and say, look, if we don't fix this problem, economic development is really going to be hurt in our state. We're gonna lose jobs, we're gonna lose companies, the quality of life here is going to decline, and we're not gonna be near as good as we can be. I think, uh, I think that's happening. I think you're seeing more companies do that. You're seeing the State Chamber of Commerce actively uh, talk with the legislature in a way, in a much more direct way, I think, than in the past. And in a more forceful try way. To explain, try, try to explain that this, this really is a, a major issue. But, and also to try to help our legislatures not get killed if they do the right thing. Right. They need cover. Uh, and, I mean, let's face it, they're in I, politics. I, they I, need I think, cover. I think really the fundamental problem that we have, the challenge that we have, is educating, is educating are the voters because the voters right now, you know, if, if, a, if a legislature 
the person in the legislature does the right thing, compromises, and does what's truly in the general interest, and then loses his office because of that, or her office because of that, you know, that, that's, that's the danger. But on the other hand, there, there is, I think sometimes we underestimate the, the value of leadership. Um, you know, I, going back to this horrible incident that occurred last year in Charleston, that all of us, it, it, it hit all of us what happened, but if the state leaders and the leader of the city of Charleston had simply followed public opinion, nothing would have changed. But they chose to courageously stand up and say, we need to make a change and we need to make it now. And the legislature also took a lot of courage, but stood up and they moved. And public opinion, when you look at the surveys of who was it for or who was against that decision, the favorable numbers changed 20 points from the time that the incident occurred until several months afterwards. I believe that not only can business leaders lead public opinion, but clearly government leaders can do the same thing, but it does require a lot of courage. And um, you know, by, by turning the pressure up, I think we're, we're, we're gonna see more courage as time goes on. Senator, we talked a lot about uh, the, the big things that are in the headlines today. Uh, some of what municipalities worry about are very local, and we're talking about water systems that are aging, that are hundreds of years old. We've seen what's happened in Flint. The same things are happening all over America. Columbia's water system where I live, it's in shambles. Sewer systems that need major upgrades. Um, these are massive investments, huge amounts of money required. Uh, and yet, the General Assembly has really not given the local government fund the money is that really they are owed. You know, we saw this happen in the recession. It gets slashed, but it's never been made up. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't seem to be any impetus in the General Assembly to give that money back to the municipalities in those counties. Right. We have folks in here who work, who work for county government, work for municipalities, wondering, you know, we paid into the system. Are we ever going to see that money again? Right. Yeah, I, th th that's, a, that's always a challenge, that local government fund. Um, not to get too wonky or into the actual policies of it. You know, I have... I have issues with the local government fund. There's not a whole lot of uh, businesses, I think, that budget their next year's budget with guaranteed funds based on last year's revenues and those sorts of things. So I, I think there's changes that we need to make to, to, uh, to the local, local government funding. But the reality is the state law says that's the way that we should be doing it now, and I believe we should be returning those funds uh, back, back to the localities. Um, Clearly because you've worked in local government, so I, I know that you're very much aware of what that means. Absolutely, you know. absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, hopefully this year with a 1.2 to 1.5 billion dollar surplus in the state government, we can get some of those funds back and and talk to the local governments about what they they actually need. Um, you know, if we're gonna if we're gonna create home rule like we did, uh, then we need to allow those those municipalities and those counties to to govern and uh, we need to provide those funds to them or uh, remove that altogether from, from state tax collections and let it be done at the local level. One of, one of the two I think we absolutely have to do. But, I mean, you're right. These water systems are, I mean, you want to talk about not sexy. I mean, that's not sexy, right? You um, never see these things until, you know, the water main breaks. Somebody, if somebody walks into their kitchen and turns on their faucet and water comes out, what's the problem, right? right? Um, but many of our rural counties, um, you know, to, to kind of continue on the conversation that we've had for the last few days, in order to improve education, in order to improve tax base, we, we have to get uh, growth and opportunity from businesses into our rural counties. Uh, well, we can't do that with the water systems that we have. I mean, uh, companies have to have that availability. So uh, it, it's, it's hard. It's hard, and it's, it's going to take it's going to take coordination from the local, state, and federal uh, levels in order in order to make those those connections. Yeah, Jack, I will tell you, you know, in the conversations we had with Volvo before they came to South Carolina, you know, workforce development was obviously a big issue, but the the number one issue really was what type of infrastructure will you be able to provide for us? The incentive package was based mostly upon water, sewer lines, roads, interchanges, that kind of thing. And I'm not going to say there was skepticism on whether or not South Carolina could deliver because we won the deal, but it was a number one on their list. Can you get these things done? Infrastructure, top priority, 4,000 jobs in an area 
that has been chronically underserved when it comes to economic development. That's correct. That's correct. If you look at the way companies make decisions today in general, and certainly Pete jump in from a Michelin perspective, the top two factors that companies take into consideration on when they make a location decision, and one is people. Are there the people there that can, that can do what we need them to do? And the second item is logistics. And I would put under that logistics infrastructure. Is the infrastructure in place? If you don't have the people and if you don't have the infrastructure, you're not going to get the deal. Simple as that. And so when we look at who we compete against as a state, we used to compete with the Southeast. We used to compete with Georgia. We used to compete with North Carolina. And we won more times than we lost. We now compete globally. We complete globally, compete globally because of assets like the Port of Charleston, uh, ironically enough, because we can get their product anywhere in the world, into or out of the country. So we need to take a step back and understand that, that if we're going to solve these challenges, it's, it's kind of a cycle here, you know, or a circle, if you will. We're talking about increasing the tax base. One of the ways you increase the tax base is bringing in new opportunities into the community, bringing in companies that are going to enhance the property tax situation, that are going to employ the citizens who are then going to spend more money. If you don't have the infrastructure, that's not going to happen. And we're talking about broad tax base. When you're managing government funds, that's the best kind of tax base to have. Sure. Yeah, and using the Volvo example, uh, the challenge is if you're familiar with where that, that uh, plant or city is going to be located, um, those folks are going to end up, vast majority, living in Dorchester and Orangeburg County, is my guess. That's right. Uh, and the reality is in both of those counties, there's very little industrial tax base. And you cannot survive, the county cannot survive on residential taxes, especially the school systems when, you know, following Act 388, which, which you know, we can't impose on uh, those operations, you can't impose on the homeowner. Though that's why, for instance, a Dorchester County uh, needs to have those local go government funds. Either provide them like, like the state is supposed to provide them, or change the system to allow them to create it themselves, one of the two. Um, but as long, and, and we want Volvo, and we want many more of those, and we want opportunities for our folks, but they gotta live somewhere, and uh, we're, it's, it's gonna be very difficult um, to support from the county governments and the municipalities without that industrial tax base. And to build on what, how companies make decisions on where they go, another factor is they look at other companies in their industry mm -hmm. and see where they're being successful. Mm -hmm. right. And you know, we were the first tire manufacturer in the state, but now there's four other tire manufacturers. Okay, there's four other tire manufacturers. And they came here primarily because they said, wow, South Carolina worked for Michelin. You know, so then the question becomes, how does Michelin react when our competitors all start coming all over the place? And um, fortunately, the, the Department of Commerce did a wonderful job in, in finding little places for each, each one of us to be, but we're not on top of each other. But the reason that, that, that it's really okay for us is because that puts more pressure on the infrastructure. That, that forces the port to be developed further. That forces, that, that's, gonna, that's gonna force the education system to improve workforce development. It's going gonna, it's gonna to force the legislature to pay more attention to infrastructure. So it, it becomes kind of a cycle. <clears throat> and right now the, the pressure is building. And I think that's, uh, you know, South Carolina is massively successful when it comes to manufacturing. In the United States, 12% of the GDP is manufacturing. In South Carolina, it's 18%. And a lot of that is with incredible companies that have come here. So now we're at this, this tipping point. And... Um, it's an exciting time to be in South Carolina, but with some very interesting we, challenges. We are the dog that caught the car. <laughs> <laughs> are. But one thing that, that Pete said that I think is important to, to, to repeat is companies ultimately locate where they can be successful. No company has chosen to locate on purpose into an area where they're not going to be successful. We have these companies in South Carolina because they're successful. We should be proud of that. The challenges that we're facing are actually good challenges. It's a result of the fact that we do things very well in South Carolina. So I think we need to look at it from that standpoint and say, this is not a negative. Again, every state has these challenges. It's how do we continue to put South Carolina in the forefront on not just solving the problems, but also creating more opportunities for our citizens. And to put that into perspective, 
we're the largest manufacturer, uh, manufacturing company in South Carolina. We're also the largest manufacturing company in the province of Nova Scotia, in Canada. And um, there's a couple of people in here, Cheryl Wilkerson and Steve Everett and I, we go up regularly to meet with the premier of Nova Scotia to try to help them with their economic development. You know, it, it, because you know, they look at South Carolina with, with absolute envy. H how does South Carolina do this? And they're unable to replicate in Nova Scotia up to this point what has been done there. Now, we want them to become better at economic development because to not have economic development is not great because in Nova Scotia, our employees work for Michelin because they have no other choice. In South Carolina, our employees work for us and they have other choices. We want them to stay at Michelin. But, but that creates a completely different dynamic. And we much prefer the dynamic where people are, where, are with us because they recognize that, that that's where they want to be. So please, you know, we're in South Carolina and we see all this. Don't take this for granted. We are very fortunate to have some of the problems that we have today. Well, it's a topic that has reached critical mass. Senator Bennett, I really appreciate you being here to talk about this in front of this crowd. Uh, Mr. Selleck, Mr. Ellenberg, thank you so much for sharing your insights in the physical infrastructure of South Carolina. Thank you.